Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to be exploring the holographic model of reality and its implications for ourselves, our bodies, and the world around us. With me today is Michael Talbot, author of several books including Mysticism and the New Physics, Beyond the Quantum, Your Past Lives, and most recently, The Holographic Universe, as well as three novels. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. Nice to be with you. You know, one of the things that you point out in the holographic universe is that this is a model that's been around now for a, a few decades, but right. it's really beginning to show its power in explaining many, many areas of personal experience and, and science. Uh, at the same time, can we talk a little bit about how the model developed? Uh, sure. It was uh, developed by two, two men, uh, University of, of London physicist named David Bohm, who's a pro former protege of Einstein and a Stanford University neurophysiologist named Carl Pribram. And they worked independently. Pribram was studying memory and found that there's evidence that the brain operates holographically. And Bohm was studying uh, subatomic physics and found that on the subatomic level, the fabric of reality seems to possess properties that are reminiscent of a hologram. Mm -hmm. So if you put those two ideas together, that our brain seems to be holographic and the universe is holographic, it suggests that maybe it's compelling evidence that, that the universe may be a kind of hologram, not that it's literally a hologram, but that it's a good metaphor or way of understanding the universe. Now, when you say it's holographic, uh, what do we mean, really? Uh, that, in a nutshell, that reality may be more plastic and, and changeable, like an image, than mm -hmm. a solid construct, a sort of sticks and stones world. It has a couple of other implications, one of which is that a hologram has an unusual property. If you take a piece of photographic film that has a holographic image encoded in it, that means that you cannot see the image with your naked eye. You have to, to reconstruct the image, you have to shine a laser through it. So if you have an image of a rose in the film, shine a laser through the rose, you'll get a three-dimensional image of the rose on the other side. If you cut that film in half, shine a laser through each piece, you'll get a whole rose out of each piece, which is a very unusual property and sort of boggles the imagination at first. Uh, cut it in four, you get four roses. Cut it in eight, you get eight roses. Mm -hmm. So the universe is a hologram. It means, as William Blake said, that quite literally you can find the universe in a grain of sand, that every portion of the universe contains some semblance of the whole, of the whole universe. That's very profound. Very. That's, I mean, that's, it's mind-boggling. And you know, one of the things that you point out in a footnote of your book that I would like to mention is that this doesn't apply for many of the kinds of holographic images that are popularly sold right, as yes. pendants and the like that don't require laser light. Right. Every, every talk I give, someone comes up and says they cut the, you know, the hologram in half on their credit card and ruined it and didn't get the effect. And it, it only applies to those images that you cannot see with the naked eye that you have to reconstruct. If you were to look at holographic film, it, it might look like ripples on a pond unless the laser light is shined through it. Right. If you, there's no decipherable image in the film, it, and it very much does look like ripples in a pond. Like when you drop pebbles into a pond, there are all sorts of little circles. In. They're called interference patterns. Right. The same as when you drop two pebbles in a pond and the, and the ripples crisscross. That is exactly what is in the film. It's the crisscrossing of the laser light that's recorded on the photographic film. So there's the sense about a hologram that there's two levels. One is this three-dimensional image that's projected, and it can look so real that you want to reach out and touch it. And then the other level are these interference patterns. Right, that, that reality in a hologram is, can, be, can manifest in two ways, as a concrete image or as, as this sort of indecipherable blur of energy. And it, an, an analogy to this is kind of when you're watching Johnny Carson on your television set, that's really, his image is encoded in two ways. One is as the concrete image on the TV set, one is as the blur of, of radio waves permeating the living room. And if the universe is a hologram of some sense, in some way, it suggests that there may be two very drastically different levels to reality, that the concrete reality we see, you know, when we look at these chairs and at, at the, you know, the trees and the clouds and everything like that. Our bodies. Are, are just one way that reality manifests, and that at some deep level, there's another, there's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an, uh, an ocean of energy that is holographically interconnected, where 
every portion of the universe is contained in every tiny area mm -hmm. of the universe. So that implies that this notion that, that we go about our everyday lives with uh, thinking of ourselves as separate from each other and the cup is separate from the coffee that goes in the cup, that, that these notions are, are, are somehow, what would you say, superficial or contradicted at a deeper level? Uh, they're, well, they're artificial, definitely, and, and Bohm really stresses this. And it, it's, it's a very interesting notion because in our Western way of thinking, we're so attached to the idea that when we come up with a concept, like a, an apple or an electron or whatever, that that exists out there and we forget, it's kind of like fish unaware of the water in which they swim, that the conceptual pigeonholes we use, words, to, to describe reality are phenomena inside our head. They're not out there. And most of the time, this is a philosophical quibble. When, but when you get down to quantum physics, and this is one of the reasons that Bohm came up with the holographic idea, it, it starts to have real effects. And one of those is it's been discovered that if you take uh, two subatomic particles like electrons, in certain instances, when you do something to one, it will always affect the other, no matter how far apart they are. That's kind of like stories that you've heard of identical twins where when one is hurt, the other feels the pain. And the problem is, is that we can find no process known to physics that explains how these could be sending a signal back and forth. In fact, because it would have to be faster than the speed of light. Instantaneous. It would have mm -hmm. to be an instantaneous signal. And Einstein's theory of relativity said you can't have instantaneous signals because it would mean that you could uh, violate the time barrier and, and conceivably call your grandfather and tell him not to marry your grandmother. And, most physicists say, well, this would be just too troubling to, to incorporate into a, a rational picture of reality. Um, Bohm explains it in a different way, which is a very interesting way. And he says, if you imagine that you've got an aquarium in which you have a fish swimming, you have a TV camera facing the front of the aquarium, one facing the side of the aquarium, and you have a monitor attached to each camera. And you also imagine further that you come from a culture that's never seen aquariums, never seen fish, never seen monitors or cameras. All you are privy to is the two images on this on these screens. He says that maybe, you know, if you look at these two screens, you're going to see a fish, at, uh, a side view of a fish and a frontal view of a fish. And if you, because you don't know what the deeper reality is, the reality of the aquarium, you may assume that these are two separate things. And but Two different fish. Two different fish, two different objects. But every time one fish moves, the other is going to make a corresponding movement. Mm -hmm. And you may then jump to the conclusion that somehow the one fish is signaling the other or communicating the other to say, hey, do this instantaneously. And Bohm says this is what we've done with subatomic particles, that we assume that an instantaneous communication is going on when that's not really what's going on at all. At a deeper level, a very holographic level of reality, every particle in the universe collapses to a sort of cosmic unity. They're not signaling each other. They're like that fish where there's the, the level of the aquarium. And so what that means, talking about words, is that there is no separation between electrons. Furthermore, there's no separation between people and this has all kinds of very boggling uh, implications, one of which um, is that we've always tried to understand, for example, psychic phenomena, like how could I get information out of your head and my head as some sort of signal going back and forth. But if we're organized, if we live in a universe that's organized holographically, you no longer have to tackle it that way. It could be that I have the entire universe and every neuron, every cell, every atom, every electron in my head, and you do also. Yeah. So when we can access that, we can access information that seems to be beyond our normal sensory reach. Well, you know, I'm very interested in psychic phenomena, and I know you've had many personal experiences, right. and I, I want to touch on it, but this is not a model that was developed in order to explain psychic phenomena. I think to neuropsychologists like Carl Prebrum, the, the fact that it happens to provide an explanation for psychic phenomena is almost a bit of an embarrassment that he <laughs> developed the holographic model because he was trying to come to terms with memory. Right. So right. let's talk about that. Sure. Um, Pribram was working under a, a very famous neurophysiologist named Carl Lashley, and it was at a time when it was believed that memory was stored in a specific spot in the brain, and there was something called the proverbial grandmother cell, that there was literally a cell in your brain that contained the memory of your grandmother, of what mm -hmm. you knew about your grandmother. And so they did a rather gruesome series of experiments for animal lovers, but it came out with some very profound uh, information. They took rats and they taught them how to run mazes, and then they would surgically remove various portions of the brain, Pribram and his, his um, mentor, Carl Lashley. The reasoning being that if they found a, if they could remove the, a, a portion of the brain and the rat could no longer run the maze, they found the area of the brain where the rat's memory of the maze running ability was encoded. Now, every time they removed a different portion of the brain, they discovered that they could never remove the memory of how to run the maze. They could impair the rat's ability so it might limp through the maze, but they couldn't remove it. And really, uh, you know, 
uh, surgeons have known this for a while, doctors have known this for a while, because when people have head injuries, they don't forget half of the alphabet or half of their family or half of a novel they read. They have global memory mm -hmm. impairment where their entire memory may be hazy. But memories don't seem to be stored in our heads in the same way that books are stored on a shelf. And it wasn't until the 60s when Priven encountered the holographic model that says that the whole is contained in every part that he said, aha, this may be what's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. Specifically, because a hologram is made out of interference patterns, the hologram that you see, you know, that we talked about earlier is made out of the interference pattern of laser light, but it can be made out of the interference patterns of any kind of energy, electromagnetic energy, electricity, uh, x-rays even. And so Pribram said, since our synapses are constantly giving off electrical impulses, these are like proverbial pebbles dropping into the sort of electromagnetic pool of our mm -hmm. brain. They're sending out ripples that are constantly crisscrossing. And he believes that's what the brain hologram, that's what, how we think and how we remember is through that hologram inside the head. Yeah. It would uh, apply in another sense, too, because if, if you take a hologram image and cut it in half or in quarters or in tenths, each time you reduce it in size, the image becomes fuzzier and fuzzier, even right. though the whole image is there, just the way memory would seem to be. In yeah, it becomes fuzzier when you have portions of the brain removed. Yeah. Correct. In, Pribram then also uh, noticed that the same principle applied uh, for visual information processing. Well, yes, it's very interesting. He did not make the discovery, but he came upon the research done by other, res uh, other investigators. And that is um, another very interesting thing. Uh, as you know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical languages. That when we go to understand physical phenomena, we generally find that there's some sort of mathematical underpinning to whatever the phenomena is. There are uncountable mathematical languages. It turns out that the mathematical language involved in the making of a hologram is a, a system of mathematics developed by a French man named Fourier. They're called Fourier transforms. Well, it also turns out that our brain uses Fourier transforms to translate visual information. And this is a very unusual state of affairs. It's kind of like discovering Eskimos speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not proof that the brain is a hologram, but it's, it's suggestive that the brain is a hologram. And it turns out, in fact, all of our senses appear to rely on sort of Fourier transforms, that they all seem to use the same mathematics. So again, here's evidence that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher the sensory world as are involved in the making of a hologram, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, not proof, but compelling yeah. evidence that something is going on there. Well, what this seems to suggest is a new way of looking at consciousness itself. Very much so, yeah. Um, it's, and it's an interesting thing. I, I have to say that I differ a little with Pribram because Pribram thinks that the brain, you know, as I said, that it's the electrical interference patterns in the brain that is a brain hologram. I'm kind of a mystic because, you know, at a young age, I had an out-of-body experience where I left my body, and it became quite apparent to me while I was having this experience that I was thinking, but my brain was back in my body, which I could see in my bed. I knew it wasn't just a dream because I floated out over uh, the ground outside my family's house, and I saw a book uh, on, lying on the ground, and it was a book by the French short story writer, uh, Guy de Maupassant, and the next day, a neighbor said, by the way, Michael, I lost a library book by Guy de Maupassant. Have you seen it? And I thought, well, I floated over <laughs> it last night. I didn't tell the neighbor that, but mm -hmm. there, there was the book. And I, I was always very, I'm still very scientifically oriented. I want to understand the world in scientific terms. But it, it, it was really the first time that I sort of had to confront, you know, the difference between my spiritual beliefs that we can survive you know, the, our bodily death, and this deeply held belief, scientific belief of mine that it's the brain that's doing the thinking. And I realized it was, I had a kind of epiphany where I thought, I, it isn't the brain that's doing the thinking. So I, I am not entirely certain that, that it's just the electromagnetic interference patterns that mm -hmm. is the brain hologram, because those obviously would perish when the brain perishes. I think there might be some subtler level, mm -hmm. uh, some subtler energy that we haven't discovered with our technology that's involved in this also. Well. Bohm's model is uh, relevant and interesting at this point because he's not dealing with the universe as a hologram made out of uh, electromagnetic interference patterns. He's looking at quantum wave potentials, which are right. at a much deeper level. And, and I must say, I've heard Pribram discuss it much the same way. There are quantum wave potentials in the brain itself, which is, is a much more deeply embedded uh, level of energy and matter than, than the electromagnetic level. Right. Uh, Bohm, it's, it's a funny thing in science. Um, uh, the great physicist uh, Herman Bondi said, called it the lure of completeness, that, that we tend, when we find some sort of outermost perimeter to what we can measure, we assume there's nothing beyond it. And I, I refer to it 
it's kind of like the the you know in ancient times when we only knew a certain portion of the world uh, people always seem to say beyond the edge of the map there be monsters mm -hmm. that there was nothing there and the same thing is going on in physics that we have with our technology reached down to a certain level in in reality and it's a common prejudice among many physicists that beyond that level, there's not, nothing exists. There be monsters. There, it's just a void, yeah. and it's it's an interesting thing that that we, as I say, we have to have this lure of completeness. We have to feel that our knowledge of the universe is all that exists in the universe. Bowman, I think, is very wisely is one of the few physicists who comes out and kind of says the emperor has no clothes. Says, what rational basis do? It's just prejudice that we assume nothing exists beyond this level of reality. Mm -hmm. And he feels that there are all kinds of, of domains of reality beyond this level, this microscopic level. And he theorizes that there may be untold, uncountable, subtle, subtler energies in these levels. The quantum potential is one. It's a theorized, uh, theorized field that has not been measured or discovered with science. But Bohm feels there's, there's evidence to posit its existence. And it's now rather well accepted, I understand, among quantum physicists. I, I wouldn't say that. Oh. I, no, it's, it's pretty controversial. And the reason it's controversial is because the standard explanation of quantum physics has bought, has decided that this lure of completeness, that mm -hmm. there's nothing beyond. Yeah, you know, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who's one of the founders of quantum physics, basically said, there's, you, you get down to a certain level of reality and things become blurry and you can't know anymore. Mm -hmm. And Bohm takes a very different route, which at this point is very uh, sort of looked down upon by a lot of physicists, because most have been schooled in the, the way of Bohr's thinking. Yes. And Bohm, the quantum potential is not looked upon kindly by most mm -hmm. physicists, I would say. Well, I don't think we want to get into too technical a discussion of quantum physics at the moment, but I, I do think it's important to bring up the uncertainty principle, because it, it in a way it's where physics comes full circle. And, and as I understand it, physics are saying, well, there may be all kinds of stuff, but we'll never know it because we interact with it. Anytime we attempt to look at particles beyond a certain level, the very act of observation changes things. Mm -hmm. and, and that brings us to a point where we realize that the distinction between subject and object breaks down. Right. But, they, but physicists get very funny about it. They get kind of schizophrenic mm. because they'll openly admit that subject and object breaks down there. But they say that somehow... This has no effect in the real world. Uh -huh. This does not translate from the microscopic level to our level, although there is a sort of creeping uh, evidence in the, the scientific world that it does translate into our level. Um, uh, one obvious example, I, I think, that it translates into our level is that helium cannot be frozen solid. It's, you can freeze hydrogen solid, you can freeze you know, carbon dioxide solid, but helium, for helium the, the, uh, to go to become its atoms to to align in a solid form would violate the uncertainty principle, and nature doesn't seem to allow that. Mm -hmm. So you can't, no matter how cold helium gets, it remains a liquid. That, to me, if you, you can have a beaker full of liquid helium, and that exists at, at our level of existence, and it's, it's a sort of manifestation of uh, the uncertainty principle, and it's where it's sort of slipped over into our world. There are other things uh, going on right now that where there's a, a device called a squid, which is, is a sort of electrical coil in which it, it looks like we may be able to demonstrate that the current, if you say which direction is the current going in the coil, it's going both directions at once, which is kind of an impossibility but to simultaneously do that. That, it, that too is a quantum phenomenon, that these two realities are overlapping. So I think we will cross that barrier. Well, I, I must admit, Michael, I'm not sure that I totally grasp uh, the implications of those examples, but the uh, examples I would like to focus on that do seem more relevant are the ones uh, that... Uh, suggests the enormous ability of the mind to affect systems in the body, uh, the placebo effect, uh, the work with uh, healing and visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this, this gets away from Bowman into Pribram, but it's, mm -hmm. it's equally interesting with equally profound implications. Pribram, as I said, says that we're thinking with holograms inside our head and that out there exists some, something that's more akin to the radio waves in the room from which your TV gets the image. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. And what we think is reality when we look out here is really just the image on the TV set inside our mind, but doesn't exist out there. And Pribram says this is why there's all kinds of evidence that we seem to respond, respond more to the models of reality in our head than out there. Uh, in, in the holographic universe, I give an example of a psychologist who did a study where he took soldiers and marched them all the same distance, but he told some they marched 
uh, like he marked them all 30 mi or 20 miles, but told some they marked 10, some they marked 20, some they marked 30. Uh, but they all marched the same distance. At the end, he took physiological readings and discovered that they were that they're physiologically they responded not to the actual mileage that they had marked, but to what they had been told, the model of reality that they assumed mm -hmm. they had, the, the reality in their heads. Mm -hmm. And in medicine, people have used this, this application of the holographic idea that we respond to the model of reality, to say this may be why we respond more to, um, to, to the placebos, to fake drugs. There's a, a very famous example of a fellow who had uh, lymphatic cancer, tumors the size of oranges all throughout his body. His doctor basically thought he had about three days left to live. The fellow heard about a new drug called Crebiosin and said, you've got to give this to me. And the doctor said, well, frankly, you know, I don't think you have long to live and this drug takes several weeks to take effect. The man implored him and the doctor gave in sort of as an act of pity. He gave the man Crebiosin and three days later, the man's tumors melted, as the doctor put it, like snowballs in a hot stove, completely gone out of his body, faster than the strongest radiation treatment could have melted them away. The man is up and around, walking around his hospital room, resumes his normal life, seems to be completely cancer-free. Several months down the line, he reads an article saying Crebiosin isn't that effective. Boom, 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 all his tumors come back. He's back in the hospital. The doctor starts to realize that maybe it wasn't the drug that cured the man, but the man's belief. So he lies to the man and he says, those articles are wrong. Crebiosin is effective, and in fact, I've got an even more potent version of it. He injects just salt water into the man's veins. Again, the man's tumors melt away. He resumes his normal life. Unfortunately, many months down the line, he reads final studies on Crebiosin saying it's completely ineffective. Boom, 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 his tumors come back and he dies. Mm -hmm. But the, the bottom line is somehow this man had the ability mm -hmm. to access some deep level of healing himself. It wasn't the drug because salt water worked just as well as this alleged drug. And so again, here's an instance where he responded to the model of reality in his head, this deep belief that this drug would heal him, even though he wasn't even receiving the drug at a certain point in his treatment. And his body responded in kind. And that to me is the most exciting aspect of the holographic idea. And there are countless examples of it. There's a study of a new chemotherapy in England uh, where they took a group of cancer patients, half the patients they gave the drug, half the patients they gave a placebo, a fake, no one knew who was receiving the real drug or not. They told all the patients, this is a very toxic drug, may cause you to lose your hair. 30% of the people receiving just the fake lost their hair. And when I first heard this, I, I immediately thought, oh my gosh, about every donut that I'd ever eaten in my life and thought, oh, this is really bad for mm -hmm. me, that I'm, I may be responding to the model of reality more than, than you know, the, the nutritional aspects of the donut. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the uh, stories of this kind have been known to scientists for hundreds, hundreds of, of years, but they've kind of been dismissed because scientists haven't had a good way to look at the possibility that consciousness can affect physical systems. It, we think of consciousness as an epiphenomenon. Right. But if, if one considers that th there are standing waves, interference patterns in, in the brain, holographic images, it gives consciousness uh, a... a I hate to use the term mechanism because I don't think that's right. quite the right term, but it gives people a model in, in which they can begin to appreciate more the role of consciousness. That's true, and it also it can be applied in another way because if, if the universe is organized holographically, it, we've always believed you know, that there is no connection between the brain and the body, and of course, I mean, for most of the history of medical science oh. in the West. In the past couple of decades, we're starting to say there's a connection and we're sorting out certain pathways, uh, you know, the neuropeptide systems, that sort of thing. But if the holographic model is correct, there are so many interconnections between the brain and the body, there ceases to be a division. Mm -hmm. So it becomes you, it, almost a, a moot point to say, what is the pathway? How is the brain connected to the body? Because there's no difference, just like there's no difference between those two electrodes. Well, and, and to take it a step further, as you do, one might say there's no solid, clear-cut distinction between ourselves and the rest of the whole universe. I mean, this has profound implications for spiritual experiences, of which you've had quite a number, and, and perhaps in the time remaining, we should touch on uh, more of those. Uh, yeah, very much so. I, as I said, I've always been very interested in science, but I also grew up in a very, with a lot of very unusual experiences, not the least of which is that I grew up in a house with a poltergeist haunting. So I had all kinds of examples of psychokinesis, of objects moving about on their own when I was growing up. And um, I, it really was a, a strange uh, in the sense that for me it was normal and I had to learn that it was abnormal and rather painful learning and as I grew up and my friends would find it very strange that these things would occur. Uh, 
And one of the things that Bohm says, because Bohm addresses the topic of psychokinesis, is again, we don't, you know, we may be mistaken to try to approach psychokinesis by saying what energy is leaving the brain to move the object, because as Bohm says, there's no division. Between psychokinesis the objects. means mind over matter. Right, moving the objects was just the power of thought alone. Mm -hmm. That we are as connected to that object as, as borderless, we're a continuum with the object as the patterns in a carpet. Mm -hmm. So for us to move the object may be, as Bohm says, just an act of resonance, of realizing that there's no division between us. Mm -hmm. And can we talk for a moment about the issue of uh, life after death or, or spiritual experiences of other realities? Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the areas you had mentioned earlier that one of the exciting things about the holographic idea is that people have taken this and explored all different realms, um, you know, that some have used it to say this is how acupuncture works because it turns out that there are little micro acupuncture systems where you can find the entire body in the acupuncture points of the ear. You're recapitulated in, right. the, in the ear, yes. Right, so that We've talked about the placebo effect. Uh, some have said that the, uh, the holographic idea applies in near-death experiences. One of these individuals is Kenneth Ring, who is uh, at the University of Connecticut, studies near-death experiences. And it's interesting because in report after report of people who have then declared clinically dead, you know, go to some apparent other level of reality and then come back. They refer to this other level of reality with terms like frequency and energy and even hologram, that mm -hmm. it's a plastic, a more plastic level of reality where thought seems to create things instantly. There are instances of people having near-death experiences where they think they're hungry and instantly food appears. Or perhaps an even better example, when people find themselves out of their body, there are cases where people look down and see that they're in a naked body and they go, oh my gosh, I'm naked. Instantly they have clothing on. Now, we don't assume that clothing has a soul, you know, that it has a spirit that survives. So somehow it appears that the mind can sort of pull out of this ocean of frequency a hologram of clothing. And this is what Ken Ring says, is that we're entering deeper into the hologram when we have near-death experiences, when we, when we leave our bodies. So there's so many different areas that have kind of been at the, the fringes of our understanding that we can now begin to look at with, with new eyes. Michael Talbot. It's been a pleasure to, to have you with me. And for those of you watching, uh, you may be interested in knowing that this discussion will be part of a Thinking Aloud inner work videotape available along with an additional hour of discussion going deeper into these questions with Michael Talbot. Michael, thanks so much for being with me. My pleasure, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. <music>
I said, well, yeah, that's what I saw. And she said, well, well, that can't be, that can't be. And my sister was visiting and had actually worn the Buddha on a pendant. Mm -hmm. And so she, I said, well, let's, she, she had told me that my sister wore it. I said, well, let's call her in and see if she, she remembers it being there. Because even I who experienced these things, you still have this sort of gnawing skepticism. Go, gosh, this can't be. Can reality really be this plastic? And I, so I said to my mother, now don't tell her that the stone materialized. Let's, you in know, front let's, of our eyes. <laughs> right, right. Let's see if she just notices it on her own. Yeah. And my mother, bless her heart, when, when my sister comes in, she, she goes, okay, okay, I won't tell her. But the moment she came in the door, she goes, Pam, the stone just appeared out of nowhere in this Buddha's head. So we didn't have, you know, a sort of straight scientific approach to it. But that's just one example. There have been many. I, I talked about the poltergeist. I, I grew up having all sorts of precognitive visions of the future, which at a very early age taught me that time wasn't as linear as, as we thought. And uh, things that, that we don't even have sort of scientific pigeonholes to put in, like a UFO encounter, and encounters with occasionally with, with beings that appear to be spirits. I'm not quite sure what they are, but, but beings that, that aren't uh, physical beings, and uh, things that, that were put just part of the natural warp and weft of my life have always been. And as I say, it really came as a shock to me to discover that other people didn't know reality was plastic, and that's why the holographic idea excited me so. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's talk about it a little more, because I think conventionally people who have these experiences search in our culture for an explanation. And explanations are not readily forthcoming from mainstream institutions. Oh, you could buy into a religious viewpoint and think of angels. Or you might go to folklore and, and talk about the little people. Or you might uh, draw on theosophy or occult traditions. But wh what added uh, insights do you get out of viewing these things in terms of a holographic model that you don't get from some of these other perspectives? Well, there are two implications or two added insights. One is that, you know, the, the science that we all learned in high school science class does not allow us to understand these things. The holographic idea is really the first sort of scientifically couched idea that says, here's how these things might be possible. But there's another, a, I kind of think, an even more profound implication of the holographic idea, and that this gets back to the notion that Bohm says that if everything is a continuum and infinitely interconnected, all of our ideas, all of the words we use to describe the world are artificial, are sort of just come out of our own belief systems and, not, and don't exist out there. And that's something that's had a, a deep effect on my thinking because it means when I've had these experiences, I don't jump, as I said, that appear to be spirits. I say this because I've, had, for example, had... Uh, a few years back had an encounter with the spirits of several wolves that appeared that I could see through their bodies. I mean, there s several wolves appeared in my apartment. I could see through them. They were there for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And this, this was an experience that I might easily go, well, these are ghosts, these are power animals, these are demons. But I, I hold my, my judgment open. I don't, I don't know what they are, but I know that these things are possible. I think it's important not to jump to conclusions because we may miss the larger picture. Most people might think I'm going crazy. Uh, well, I don't anymore. I mean, I never seriously thought I was going crazy because I'm very emotionally healthy, mentally healthy. And these things uh, have never, have always been positive in my life, have always assisted me, and have always been a, a good thing, helped me survive. And those people who don't know, I, there were many years when I didn't tell people I had these experiences and no one thought I was crazy. And, you know, they might have had I told them the experiences. But the rest of my life has always been, you know, I'm a very sort of ordinary person except for those things. Uh, and I think, you know, that craziness is, if you have an experience of, an, of a non-ordinary reality, that's not evidence of craziness. Craziness is if you have some sort of pathological problem, something that's, that's destructive to your health or well-being, and I've never had that. Mm -hmm. But I think it might be a bit uh, glossing over from what you've told me already, Michael, just to say that, say, your poltergeist experiences were 100% positive. Uh, well, that's true because nothing, I mean, again, we're putting a, our own intellectual pigeonholes over it. I th there were negative aspects of the poltergeist. Could you, would you mind telling the whole story? Sure. Um, this, the poltergeist, I always thought the poltergeist started when I was five years old and it started raining gravel down on the roof of my family's home at night. And at the time, we didn't think this was paranormal. No one knew what was going on. We lived, I grew up in Michigan. We lived in a very rural area in the midst of the woods. My father would go out with a shotgun because he thought someone must be doing it, and he could never find any evidence that someone was doing it. He'd shoot the gun off into the, into the air. In the morning, he'd go out and sweep several shovelfuls of gravel off the roof. And it, then things became very definitely paranormal when this, whatever this manifestation was, went into the house. It would, one of its favorite things to do was to throw the vacuum cleaner around, 
You didn't always see it. Most often you didn't. My mother, if she were vacuuming and turned the vacuum cleaner off and left it in one corner of the room and would leave the room, you'd hear it crash and go back in the room and be in an op the opposite side of the room. Uh, occasionally you would see things. I uh, saw uh, on one occasion a glass all of a sudden just came swooping through the room from no apparent uh, you know, source. The windows were closed. There was no one there who could have thrown it. Uh, the poltergeist was also fond of throwing, I, strangely enough, pieces of drift glass, or broken beer bottles or pop bottles that you find worn smooth on the beach. And once in my New York apartment, because the poltergeist followed me wherever I moved until I was in my early 20s, I saw, actually saw one of these things materialize. I was just sort of daydreaming, looking up near the ceiling. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this, this strange little brown thing appeared. And I, as I, I looked at it, it came zooming down at me, hit me in the chest, dropped to the floor, and it was one of these pieces of glass. And so these were, um, you know, extraordinary things. And, and, but at the same time, I and my family became so accustomed to them. I have two sisters that if we'd be playing, because another thing the polar guys would do was stomp all over. It'd stomp up the stairs, down the stairs to the room. You'd hear bang, 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 bang. And if we were playing, it got so, if we heard something stomp up the stairs and glanced over to the stairs and there were nothing there, we'd just go back to playing. It was so mundane, a part of our existence. And um, you, you said they did have negative aspects. You know, it wasn't all positive. That's true because one of the things that I discovered and has caused me to believe that the poltergeist was an unconscious psychic projection of mine is that it was always colored by my moods. And most of the time I was in a good mood and it was mischievous. It would do silly things, like one morning I woke up with dried spaghetti noodles all over my chest and no explanation. I lived alone and no, unless a burglar broke in, boiled some noodles, you know, and threw them on my chest, I don't know where they came from and I have no history of sleepwalking or anything like that. Another uh, instance, it took all of my socks, draped them over the, the plants in, the, in my house. Silly things like that. But if I were in a bad mood, if I were going through some sort of rough time in my life, the poltergeist became nasty. And there were a few occasions, not many, where stigmata-like bites would appear in my hands uh, a couple of times uh, needles, or the metal objects that were halfway between nail and needle would appear out of nowhere, just zoom into my flesh. And this, this only happened twice. Mm -hmm. And things like that. So you could construe those as negative. But on the other hand, I view them as positive because I learned so much from them. Well, I, I think it's important to mention this because, you know, in a lot of the folklore, these kinds of manifestations are associated with the demonic. And I right. think by using the lens of a holographic model, you're able to see it in a different light. That's true, and it's important mm -hmm. to note that. And yeah. one of the things that I've learned from it is when these negative things were happening, there were occasions, even though I'd had lengthy experiences with this poltergeist, that I'd start to think, oh my gosh, maybe I'm being demonically attacked. When I believed that, it started to manifest even more as a demonic attack. But when I would sort of come to my senses and go, no, I know that this is, I can see the emotional reason that this is, is manifesting in this way, and go, okay, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to, you know, have a positive frame of mind. All the negative stuff would stop. I always had control, but if I relinquished that control and allowed my beliefs to go into some interpretation, go, it's a demon, it's a this, it's a that, then it would get me. Mm -hmm. And there was an another instance uh, where I, when I lived in my New York apartment, where I was um, playing piano at night, uh, I had the lights off. I was playing in the dark, and I, I live on the ground floor, and the piano is situated so that the back of the piano is toward a window. And as I was sitting there, playing away, all of a sudden, there was a, an intense burst of light in my face. It was like a flash bulb went off right in my face. And my first just sort of visceral reaction to it was, oh my gosh, a, a truck is driving, it's come off the road, and it's driving through my window. So I literally threw myself over the piano, thinking that I'm about to be killed by this, this truck or whatever. And a after I sort of regained my, you know, uh, my senses and stood up, I looked back at the window. There was no sign of what had caused this light. And I thought, well, that is strange. And I turned back around, and as I looked in the room, there was what looked like a, a luminous soap bubble about three feet in diameter hovering in the air. And it sounds strange, but it terrified me, because people go, what's so scary about a luminous soap bubble? But it was so unexpected and yet so real. And I immediately, I started moving my eyes from side to side to see if it was an afterimage on my retina. I started blinking to see mm -hmm. if it would go away. And it was as real as the tables and the chairs. Mm -hmm. And there was a distinct sort of feeling of evil coming from it. Mm -hmm. And I started to run out of the room. And then I caught myself. And I thought, because I'm, I'm basically an ex just an extremely curious person by nature. And I thought, if I run out of the room, I'm always going to wonder what this thing was and what would have happened had I stayed. So I really summoned my courage and I stopped. And I addressed it. I said, I want you to know you just scared the daylights out of me. But I'm s I want to know why you're here and what you are. And when I said this, this bubble, which is hovering in the air, backed up. And somehow I knew that the fact that it had backed up, that it had wanted to scare me, and it had backed up. 
Now, this bubble appearing had been uh, presaged by a number of very negative poltergeist phenomena, the, a couple of the bites that occurred at that mm -hmm. time in this. I didn't know what was going on. The, the bubble after it was only there for maybe a minute or two, but it seemed like an eternity at the time. Then the bubble uh, left the room, hit a door, and sort of burst and sparkles and was gone. And but distinctly negative was my, I mean I knew it was a negative presence. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of days later, a friend called me and I had not told her about the experience or anything, and she said, "Michael, I have a letter that I think you should read." And it turned out I had just moved to New York from Michigan. I'd attended Michigan State University. And there was a group of people there that were really only acquaintances of mine. They weren't that important in my life, but they were into black magic. And somehow they had fancied, which was totally their fantasy, not, not mine, that I was some sort of magician and that they had, that I was attacking them. And so they were doing group meditations and casting spells to get me. Counter magic. Right. <laughs> and I, uh, I had not even thought of these people. Right. But what that taught me is that I realized that because I still think I was in, in part feeding this phenomena with my own psychic energy, is that I was not shielding myself. Because what happened when I learned this, I, I, while it was going on, I was so interested, I allowed it to happen because I wanted to see where it was going. I wondered what the bubble was. I didn't say, okay, get out of my reality. But as soon as I found out they were, what they were doing, I said, okay, all of this stops now. And th just through an act of will, mm -hmm. said, this will not go this direction. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I, I put forth that act of will, all of these things, the, the negativity ceased, and the poltergeist resumed its, its harmless aspect. And what that taught me is that, you know, I'm sometimes asked, do you think people can cast spells or can exert an outward influence to you? And I think that our will is always, it's what our will determines. But you also have to be conscious. You have to sort of shield yourself. And I have learned that I have to be, have developed a, a strong belief that I'm protected so that my unconscious doesn't believe that I'm not protected and allow these things to occur. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you are protected. Mm -hmm. So your sense is that these various events are taking place at, at another level of reality that's related to the holographic model. I, I do. I think that they're not just hallucinations, and I say that because I've had equally extraordinary experiences where there have been other people present and seen the same thing. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, again, you know, as the holographic model says, there's no division between the brain, our thoughts and the world out there is that they always have some sort of psychological correlation with what's going on in my life. I can look at them and I can go, the reason this is negative is because these people were casting spells. And there have been event after event after event, or the reason the poltergeist is negative is because I'm going through a bad period emotionally. And I've, so I've discovered that they are psychological exteriorizations that become real. Mm -hmm. And I say that because, as I say, I don't believe they're hallucinations because other people have witnessed them with me. And the only explanation in my mind is that our thoughts do project into reality on occasion, do bleed through from the subjective mm -hmm. to the objective. Now, I want to explore with you more carefully the nature of the poltergeist entities themselves and these other realities. And I think a good way to approach that would be to step back for a minute and talk a little bit about what is life, what constitutes a living being. Well, again, we're getting into this area of conceptual pigeonholes putting yeah. over, you know, on the universe. Right. And it's interesting. In another book of mine, I address this issue at some length, Beyond the Quantum, because if you try, if you think about it, how can you define life? You know, there's every time anyone has tried to come up with a definition, well, life reproduces itself, it uses oxygen, whatever your definition is, you can always find something that doesn't seem to be alive that fulfills those criteria. My sixth grade science class, my teacher gave a list of things that, that uh, categories or, or qualities that she said, this typifies a living thing. And it occurred to me that fire fulfilled all those qualities. And I said, you know, excuse me, does that mean fire is alive? She said, well, no, obviously not. And I said, well, how does this, you know, mesh with your definition? And this was addressed a few years back um, by in a book called Life Beyond Earth by a physicist named Gerald Feinberg and uh, a biochemist named Robert Shapiro, where they try to come up with a definition of life. And in a strange kind of way, they arrived at a definition that, in my mind, says that everything is alive. They don't quite interpret it that way. But they said life is, the more ordered a phenomena is, the more that you can assume it's alive. But again, order, how do we recognize order? Order is something that we recognize with our heads. And in quantum physics, there's, like Bohm, for example, says that, that electrons appear to be alive. And he's not alone. There are a number of physicists who think that every portion of the universe is, live, is, is alive. And I think. I, I've come to believe that every small fragment of the universe possesses some life, mm -hmm. that it is a manifestation of life, of, of some kind of consciousness, not, this, not a human mm -hmm. consciousness. 
but some kind of consciousness. And you can't draw a distinct border between what is alive and what is not. Uh, I might just mention parenthetically that one of the best works I'm aware of in this regard is Arthur Young's uh, book, The Reflexive Universe, in which he discusses the amazing uh, qualities of a photon that, that seem to exhibit right. consciousness. Yeah, the, the particles seem to make decisions in unique ways. Yeah. You can shoot an electron at a barrier. If you throw a, a pebble at a window, it, I, you know, it either hits the window and bounces off, or it, it just hits the window and breaks through. You shoot an electron at a barrier, it can do all kinds of things. It can hit, bounce off, it can stop just before the window, dematerialize, materializes on the other side. Uh, it can uh, stop just before the window and reverse its direction. And the, these, you cannot take any electron and predict what it will do, just like you cannot take any human being and with absolute certainty predict what it will do, which is, you know, there's a sort of uncertainty principle in life, and I think it's this quantum indeterminacy that that, that everything possesses, mm -hmm. living and, and what we formally call non-living. So as these holographic patterns, these interference patterns, come together, they form like standing waves, in, in a sense. And these holographic standing waves can manifest in, in different ways. I mean, your experiences are quite unusual. I doubt if many viewers will have the kinds of experiences that you have. And yet, I think they're very important for us all to know about, because they they represent things that are kind of on the fringes of our own experience in, right. in different ways. And what you're suggesting is, is that there's a kind of, I, I don't know the right word, and of course you've pointed out the problems with words, but a quasi-lifelike quality to these poltergeists that it doesn't quite fit, the, you know, the old occult models. Like, I don't know. Uh -huh. No, they represent, you know, Carl Jung said that our, our complexes, you know, think that the sort of belief systems or the agendas that manifest in our consciousness mm -hmm. are quasi-independent, that they take on a life of their own, and yet they're a projection of our consciousness, mm -hmm. and not a projection, but a, a manifestation of our consciousness. And to me, the poltergeist was like a, a complex. It was like one of these semi-autonomous things, yeah. but it wasn't only inside my psyche any longer. It manifested. It exteriorized. And I think, you know, you look, there's so many phenomena like this that we try to interpret it as, as objective. The UFO phenomenon is a classic example where it just doesn't seem to fit a, a purely objective explanation. They, you know, there are thousands and thousands of UFO experiences every year. Many of them take a very absurd form, and it just doesn't seem possible that we could be visited by thousands and thousands of extraterrestrials behaving so absurdly all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet the evidence is very substantive that there's something going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the first. Many people have looked at this and said, Gosh, there seems to be a, a psychological quality to these things, and yet they seem to be real. And I believe, I've coined the term omnijective, that the universe is all omnijective. It's neither subjective nor objective. That, that everything possesses qualities uh, that we associate with both. And the UFO phenomenon, if you look at it, it can almost, I believe, can be interpreted like a dream. That, that the, there are metaphors and symbols that it speaks in the language, what Eric Fromm called the forgotten language, the language of the psyche, this symbolic language of the dreams. And in fact, all of the mystical experiences I've had, instead of looking for them and going, this is an angel, this is a ghost, this is a spirit, I look at them, I go, this is real, and other people have seen it, but what is its psychological meaning? What is it meant to teach me? How is it a, a projection of my consciousness, my psyche, and perhaps the psyche of those who have witnessed it with me? Let's go into more detail and more depth about your own personal encounter with this poltergeist, how you came to understand what it really was for you. Well, you know, I don't know how I came to understand. I always just sort of knew it was a projection of mine. I mean, when I was a very small child, I didn't because you don't have the intellectual savvy of an adult. But as I grew older, it was just so obvious to me that it was such a direct reflection of my interior landscape, of my, what was going on in my psyche, that I, I automatically assumed it was. And it c came as a shock to me when I started reading about poltergeist that people didn't just accept that matter-of-factly, that, of course, it is one of the standard explanations is that it's a projection. But there's still people who say, maybe it's a spirit, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Yeah. And so there was, I don't have a specific point in time where I went, aha, this is the event that teaches me. I always just kind of understood it. But you developed some kind of a relationship with it as time went on. I did develop a relationship uh -huh. with it. And I guess, you, you know, the one thing that did help me understand it in those terms was a, an experiment conducted by the parapsychologist A.R.G. Owen, where he and a group of people got together. And they decided to create, they, to hold seances, but instead of conjuring up a ghost, they decided to create a ghost. So they, they named him Philip, and to, to make sure that they were creating this ghost, what they did is they constructed an artificial history for Philip, but one that, didn't, that contained historical inaccuracies. 
like they said he was a uh, lived you know in the Middle Ages. But the king at the time that that he lived was not the king that actually lived in those times. It was a king that had it's died. A fictional before. ghost. A fictional ghost. Yes. And they held the seance. And there's there's two. There's another interesting thing in this is that they start they approach it first by being very mystical and very solemn and sitting around a table and holding a seance. And that way, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And then they then they read uh, about the research performed by earlier an early investigator that said the Victorian seances were always very boisterous. They drank. Yes. They laughed. They sang. So that's, they started holding seances where they laughed and they drank and they sang. And boom, Philip started manifest, would start to answer through table rappings. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that Philip was a projection of the group in the sense that, like Philip, for example, enjoyed certain songs. And he's happened to enjoy certain songs that the group enjoys singing. Mm -hmm. However, if one member of the group wasn't there that night, Philip might drop one of his favorite songs and have no knowledge of it. So it seemed that that member was contributing that favorite song. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Philip was quasi-independent because he made up some things on his own that didn't that no one was consciously adding to his history. One of the things they said is that he had left his wife and fallen in love with a barmaid. And Philip, through this table wrapping communication, they he said, "Oh, by the way, I never loved her. I just I just lo you know went away with her, but I never loved her." Mm -hmm. And he came up with that. No member of the group had fabricated that aspect of Philip. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, this is this too is a quality of the psyche. I I learned this once when I was um, I used to have a problem where I would nervously pull out the hairs in my beard. And I thought, okay, I've got to stop this. And so, just through an act of will, I, I, you know, went cold turkey on this habit, as one has to do with habits. And I was sitting and typing at my word processor one day, and all of a sudden I realized that I was typing with one hand. And I thought, why am I typing with one hand? And I looked down, and my other hand was sneaking up to pull a beard hair out. I was a part of my psyche was trying to fool myself and pull this out. So it became quasi-independent. That habit was part of me. But it was autonomous. Also it de you created it, and then it developed. You know, it develops its own agenda. Let, and let me speculate a little bit because throughout this entire program, I've had this urge to pull something out of my <laughs> eye, and I've been looked. I looked in the mirror earlier, and I realized there are no hairs. There's nothing tickling me. I thought there was, and yet I kept yeah. feeling it like that. That could be an example of some kind of a, a holographic standing wave, or right? Well, morphogenetic field, or and in anyone something. who's meditated knows yeah. that. You know, when you try to quiet your mind, you're assailed by w one thought after another, and they seem to as assail you, not you bring them in. Mm -hmm. They have their own independence, their own agenda. And uh, when I look at my interior landscape, I, every emotion, every desire, every feeling I have, I recognize is a part of me, but has its own inner impetus. Mm -hmm. As self-organizing becomes semi-autonomous and swarms in my head, and I, I really come to think of myself not as I, but as we. And it, it, you know that each of us is a, a just a plethora of different consciousnesses, thousands, perhaps you know, uncountable consciousnesses. That our psyche is as rich with these entities, which are part of us. They're 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 not separate from us, but they also have their own agenda. But our psyche is as rich with these things as as the Amazon rainforest is rich with life forms. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting points that uh, you made in an earlier discussion is that many of these phenomena, although they're quite real and they have a, an autonomous uh, reality after we ourselves have created them, but they might not necessarily be meaningful. Uh, they might be striking in a sense, right. but lead nowhere. Right. Well, I think synchronicities fall in that category. They're synchronicities are meaningful coincidences, things that seem to be just coincidence but occasionally are incredibly meaningful. Sometimes they're not. I had a, a series of synchronicities um, uh, where uh, one morning uh, I was doing push-ups and I had the TV on and there was a game show and I wasn't consciously l watching the game show and all of a sudden as I'm doing push-ups I, I realized that I answered one of the questions without consciously focusing on what the game show was about. And I said, who was Buffalo Bill? And it was Jeopardy in the game show. The question had been, you know, William Cody, Buffalo Bill's other name. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. And later that day, a friend called me up and he said, you know, if anyone knows the answer to this question, maybe you do, but we're, John, we're having an argument here. And he, my friend's an actor. And he said, were John Barrymore's dying words, aren't you the illegitimate son of Buffalo Bill, to a <laughs> stagehand that mm -hmm. he'd collapsed? And I thought about it. I thought, well, there's Buffalo Bill again. But it didn't really sink in too much because it was just a second time it happened. Later, later that day when the mail came, I got a Smithsonian magazine and I opened it up, and, and the article I opened it up to was, Buffalo Bill is alive and he's coming back. And so there was boom, 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 Buffalo Bill three times in a row. Now, occasionally I have synchronicities three times in a row or something like that. 
that I look at and I go, oh, this is what this is meant to teach me. But mm -hmm. in this particular instance, I, I thought, this is a kind of little holographic dust storm that's gathered that doesn't have cosmic significance. And I really sort of frown on people that every event in their life, they go, this is meaningful. I've got it. What is God telling me because the chair fell here? Or what? Sometimes they're meaningful. Sometimes mm -hmm. they have profound meaning. But sometimes they're just these little self-organized exteriorizations of the psyche that are spinning outside of yourself like a dust storm and don't necessarily have meaning. And I guess the ability to make that distinction, to be able to discern between them, uh, comes from understanding or having a, a, a sensitivity to an appreciation for the, the holographic landscape around us. Well, to understand how they can manifest, definitely. Mm -hmm. And equally understanding how the, you know, the language of the psyche, which we don't do. You know, so we don't even pay much attention to our dreams. And yet we have this enormous, you know, this enormous universe inside ourselves that's constantly giving us lessons and messages. And you know, I, I interviewed uh, this uh, psychiatrist Montague Allman for this book, and he he said something which I knew, but he articulated in a way that really sort of drove the meaning home for me. And he said that you know that he he has lots of patients. He said it doesn't matter who the patient is in the waking state. He can have a man who's a total jerk. Mm -hmm. But in his dreams, there's a wisdom that's way beyond him. Mm -hmm. That his dreams are constantly trying to teach him not to be a jerk or not to be selfish or not mm -hmm. to be greedy or whatever. And I thought this is true. Our dreams have this this wisdom, and yet most human beings don't pay enough attention to dreams to even remember them on a regular basis. They they let them in the, you know exist in this foggy I interior world, and they don't access it. I think it's the Talmud that's written. It says an uninterpreted dream is like a letter left unopened, mm -hmm. and I believe that. I think we have to do that as well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to push the boundaries even further now, Michael, and I, I, I know that you've had personally some uh, UFO types of experiences very much related to the sorts of things that uh, Whit Whitley Strieber reports, and, and I want, wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, narrating for us what happened to you and uh, how you've come to view these experiences. Yeah, I don't mind at all. And they, <coughs> they were actually started with something that doesn't seem to be a UFO experience. But when I was three years old, <coughs> uh, I have a memory in my head. And I don't know where it began or where it ended, but it, it's absolutely vivid to this day. Of This woman, I call her a woman, but I don't know. It might just have been an androgynous being, a figure with long white hair wearing a long white robe, taking me out of my bed and walking me through a woods. And I was terrified because I, I was uh, dark and I didn't know who this person was. The only way that I could deal with it was to sort of tell myself this has got to be my mother, even though my mother, this did not fit the physical description of my mother. Uh, we got to the shore of a lake, and this, this entity this said to me, are you afraid, Michael? And I said, yes, I'm very afraid. And he said, then hold your hand, palm upward toward the moon. I did that, and he said, now close your hand very slowly. And as I did that, I felt a softness in my hand, a palpable softness, like when you hold your hand outside a car window and feel the wind. But there was no wind blowing through my hand. And this, this being said, do you feel that? And I said, yes. And she said, then, or it said, or he said, then I want you to remember, Michael, whatever happened in your life, don't ever be afraid, because for you the darkness is soft. And it was a very comforting message. And then a couple of years later, I, I said it, I told my mother about it, and she didn't quite know what, you know, she said, no, no, being took you out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, when you're a child, you don't process these things intellectually. You just accept the world in a mm -hmm. sort of magical way. How old would you say you were? I think it was about three when, when this occurred. Mm -hmm. And when I was five, my father and a friend saw a UFO come down in the woods near where my, my family's house was. And they av it was then obscured by the trees, but out of the trees came two figures. First, a man in a black business suit carrying an attache case, which was completely absurd. And at the time, we did not know that this is a common motif in UFO lore, that in UFO experiences, they're called the men in black. They do, of course, they don't make sense if they're extraterrestrials, unless they're like, you know, extraterrestrial Amway salesmen or whatever. But uh, it, so they, they were just, you know, completely nonplussed by this experience. Then out of the woods came this figure with long white hair and a long white robe. And the, the man in the business suit vanished, walked off into the thicket and was gone. But the figure in the long white, with the long white hair and the long white robe stopped in a cornfield and stood there. My father and his friend became very frightened. Go back to uh, my mother, m myself, and my father's friend's wife were camping out less than a mile from where this had occurred. They came back and they got us in the car and they said this amazing thing happened. They told us a story, drove us up. And w I, when I looked at this being, I thought, oh, it's her. It's the, I always called her the woman in white. It's the woman in white. And, but again, as a child, you don't necessarily even mention these things. I didn't say, oh, by the way, that's her to my parents. 
My father wanted to go see this, this being, talk to it, and say, what are you, why are you here? My mother said, no, no, no. And, and finally, we watched it for about 10 minutes, and finally drove away, not, not knowing quite what to do, since everyone was too afraid to approach it. The next day, my father went back with a, a neighbor who taught uh, astronomy at the local Grand Rapids Junior College. And they looked for the landing site of this thing that had come out, which looked like a green ball of light mm -hmm. came zooming out of the air. They couldn't find the landing site, but they did find the footprints of this being in this white robe, and they were, looked like little skis. They were pointed and very narrow, and they went back into the, the woods. They took photographs of the footprints with my father's hand next to him for size comparison. Unfortunately, the photographs have been misplaced, but there, lots of people who had seen them at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that experience, af after that occurred, is when the poltergeist phenomena manifested in the house. And it's uh, become known now in UFO phenomena that poltergeist hauntings often follow UFO sightings. And this is further evidence that UFOs aren't just a purely objective phenomena. They seem to blow some sort of psychic doorway open in people when strange things start happening. And with me, I believe it blew some sort of gasket open that allowed this psychokinetic essence or energy to come out. Mm -hmm. And um, when I look at this and try to interpret it in terms of, as I say, extraterrestrials, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, I believe that, I don't quite know what it is, but I believe the universe has many, many levels of reality. I think UFOs are non-physical. I definitely think that we're not necessarily meant to interpret them at face value. And when you say non-physical, are you implying that they're not part of this holographic reality either? They're, they're a different channel on the holographic television set, a different channel than our physical universe is mm -hmm. on, is what I believe. Yeah. And I, th I think they're uncountable channels on the holographic TV. And probably as many civilizations and, and such a richness of life on those levels as there is on our own planet, on, on, in our own universe, probably. And that there are probably consciousnesses and civilizations that are advanced enough to bleed through but maybe some of these things also, uh, we don't, you know, there may be, they may be like just at the level of, of wildlife, you know, in their mentality, but on another level of reality. They may not be sophisticated, but they may have the ability to sort of manifest in a form that, that fools us. And actually what I think is going on is that when you encounter something that is of truly of another reality, you don't, you can't, your perceptions and trying to pull it out of the, this blur of energy and make a, it into a hologram, don't quite know how to put it into form. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the reason there are many psychological motifs in UFO experiences is because there's something going on, but the surface appearance is a product of the person's own psyche. In other words, a lot of what's going on in these various holographic realities are like ink blocks. Right, right. They're, they're, they can be interpreted like dreams as well, that mm -hmm. they have psychological symbols in them. Mm -hmm. But they're also something real there, because UFOs mm -hmm. can be tracked on radar. They leave circles you know, on the ground. They leave traces of physical evidence. And so I think, I'm reminded there's a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal, I've never really been able to track it down. It's been attributed to Darwin Magellan, but something to the sense that, that w I th if you use Magellan, that when Magellan first went ashore in Tierra del Fuego, that the natives saw that he came ashore in rowboats, but he left his ship anchored out in the harbor. And um, they said, well, how did you get here? And he said, in that ship. And they couldn't see the ship. Yes. And we certainly know that there's evidence of this. You know, there. There are tribes in the Gold Coast of Africa that can't see photographs, that can't see movies. And that, that there's sometimes, you know, that, that there seems to be our cultural upbringing imprints in us what we can perceive. That sometimes we literally can't perceive something because we don't have the vocabulary, the cultural and perceptual vocabulary to see it. I think UFOs fall into that category in a very extreme way. That they are so alien to our ordinary perception that our brain really pull, pulls deep psychic bag psychological baggage out of our out of our psyches to put them to hammer them into some form and when we look at them and read them at face value like that they're abductions or whatever I think that we're looking at our own unconscious ex interpretation of the phenomena and that we have to go deeper we have to see beyond our own psychological baggage to truly begin to recognize and understand what's going on mm -hmm. well it would seem to me that uh, it's true that we've been blinded by our, our culture. We're very much like uh, the, the people, in, as described in Plato's cave, who can only see the shadows on the wall and, and not the light. Uh, but yet, I feel that something's happening. There's a movement in the culture. The very fact that you can take a, a rather respectable scientific concept, like the holographic model of the brain and the holographic model in physics, and 
and see uh, that it can be, without a lot of stretching, used to uh, incorporate many of these very things. And, and Prebrum, for one, acknowledges uh, that as well, suggests that right or wrong, the model is, is helping us to open our eyes to these things. I think things. so, yeah. It's interesting, there's a m sort of a bit of a movement afoot to begin to look at these things, you know, because it's kind of the story of the blind man and the elephant, where mm -hmm. they go up, one touches the trunk, one touches the leg, and says, well, this animal's like a snake, no, this animal's like a tree, because they're not seeing the whole picture. And there are various uh, researchers, for example, Ken Ring, the, who I mentioned earlier, the near-death experience researcher, who said, look, let's look at UFO experiences, let's look at shamanistic experiences, and let's look at near-death experiences, and look at their similarities. Maybe they're all portions of some proverbial elephant that we're missing. And I think he's right. I think that they're all experiences with the other channels on the holographic TV set. And when we interpret them at face value, their extraterrestrials come here to abduct us and perform genetic research or whatever, we're, we're being like the blind men and the elephant. Mm -hmm. And we've got to look at the larger picture. Yeah. Now, have you in your adult life had further uh, UFO experiences as a follow-up? Well, I have had. I'm, as an adult, I had a, a period when I was in college where I was driving with a friend and uh, we saw a UFO and got out of our car. We were going from uh, East Lansing, Michigan to Saugatuck, which I believe was something like a two-hour drive. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but we knew how long the drive was supposed to take. We got out of our car to watch this UFO, and we watched it for what we thought was about five minutes, and we made no other stops. And when we arrived uh, at, at our destination, all of our friends said, where have you been? You're hours late. And this was the first time that we looked at our watches and realized that we had this proverbial missing time, that we had lost time. Now, I've had people try to hypnotize me, and unfortunately, I, I have not gone under to be able to access what occurred in that missing time. But th I, I believe that, you know, something, you know, I had some encounter with this uh, non-ordinary reality that we're, in this particular instance, labeling UFO, but as I say, it's part, just the tip of the iceberg of something vaster. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the pieces of the puzzle earlier, and, and one piece that we haven't touched on I'd like to uh, bring in now is relates to past lives. You've written a book, Your Past Lives, on, on this very topic. Uh, do you see it relating? Oh, I, I do very much so. I think, I think we, we human beings know so little about the universe. And I had uh, another personal experience that I had was when I was a very small child. I remembered my past lives, fragments of them. Uh, I did not know the word reincarnation. I was very confused. But the, the memories and my, my realization that I had lived before were so vivid that I wouldn't call my parents mom and dad. I didn't understand why these two kindly people were saying they were my parents because I knew I had other parents. And I thought, where am I? Why am I here? And I remembered different periods of history. And I, again, I didn't know what periods they were. It was a visual memory. And it was very confusing for me. And I, I would always manifest all these strange habits. I drank incredibly strong black tea. At a, like at the age of six, I was brewing myself tea whenever I could get away with it without my parents finding out. I sat cross-legged on the floor. I would never sit in furniture. It took, took years to train me to sit in chairs. And lots of things, I, I remembered various ways that I died. I would ask my mother, I'd say, well, do you remember when I drowned? Why, how, why did I drown? She didn't know what I was talking about. But as I grew older and learned about the concept of reincarnation, I realized that I had all these experiences. And I want to very quickly say I don't remember being any pharaoh, you know, anyone famous, anything like that. I think there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of nonsense associated with reincarnation. And, um, Such as the idea, why does everybody think they were Cleopatra? Right, uh -huh. which uh, I don't think, I think people, you know, if you have eight people who think they're Cleopatra, you don't have evidence of reincarnation, but of something a bit more frivolous. Yeah. And, um, but the research doesn't show that everybody thinks they were somebody famous. No, no, quite there's the a, contrary. no, quite the contrary. There's a, a past life uh, researcher, a psychologist named Helen Wambach, who's deceased now, but she uh, regressed large groups of people, uh, hundreds, and sent them back to various past lives. And, and what she would do is she would pick a time period, for example, the 1850s, 60s, and say, what were you alive then? And if so, where were you? Figuring that if people were fantasizing, even at an unconscious level, that they would associate that time period <laughs> with the Civil War. And she would come up with a lot of Civil War past lives. She didn't. And, and in fact, in all these literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of past lives, she had no one who remembered being anyone famous. She also had things that seemed to very much mesh with historical reality. Only 10% of the past lives that her subjects had lived were lived as ar aristocratic lives or in lives of, of luxury. Mm -hmm. The other 90% were grueling as peasants, as laborers, you know, eking out, you know, food, hunter gatherers, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And uh, some very interesting historical uh, pieces of information came out. Like she started to discover that at various time periods, 
people describe forks as having, not d like at one point, people said forks had two prongs, then they had three, then they had four. So n and this is a very obscure historical fact, but that is the, the progression of the fork. So there are things like that, but as I say, no, mm -hmm. no famous people, and it did seem to, to reflect historical reality, not fantasy. Because mm -hmm. who would fantasize being a, a peasant or a laborer? Mm -hmm. you know? Well, now, we've talked about past lives, we've talked about poltergeists, we've talked about UFOs, and we've talked about the holographic model in science. How do you integrate these? Well, I, th I think they're all part of a s the same reality, that we live in a, a, a spiritual universe, that I, I very much believe that our soul lives many, many lives and goes through these things. And I think at this point in our development that, we've been that we ha have manifested in the physical because... We don't have a consciousness that's developed enough to deal with reality with its full grandeur and plasticity. That for us, it would be very frightening if there weren't solid rules, if everything started to slip and slide. But I think as your soul goes along, it starts to learn to deal with more than this reality, with other levels on the, the holographic television set. And when you start to open those <laughs> doorways, that's when reality, the plasticity of reality, starts to seep in. But then you go through a sort of shamanistic rite of passage because you've got to go through, most people go, put an interpretation on it. They go, oh, this is an angel, or this is you know, a demon, or a UFO abduction. And if you do that, you're missing the basic lesson of shamanism, which is that everything that you experience in, in the non-ordinary reality of a shaman has psychological meaning for you, that, that you are entering a level of reality that responds so directly to your thoughts that your every thought helps what manifests. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, you can't ask what is there but why have I created what is there? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the lesson that our souls are learning as we evolve. In other words, one might say that these various so-called paranormal experiences, or what uh, my friend and mentor Arthur Young would call, oh, wow, <laughs> kinds of experiences, uh, they serve another purpose. And it's not an obvious uh, purpose necessarily, but perhaps ultimately it's to push us somehow into a higher state of consciousness, to, to force us to try and and understand the deeper meaning. I, and I agree with that. And it's, it's they're a natural uh, manifestation of the evolution of consciousness. As your soul evolves, you start to open up the plastic levels of reality. Mm -hmm. And these things start to enter. And that in itself teaches you. You know, that mm -hmm. it may not necessarily be that the universe is saying, here, I'm giving you this to teach you. But you are manifesting what you have to learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. Just as we, you know, we manifest moods and beliefs that we have to learn about if we're to deal with them properly. These are things that manifest in a very, in a very profound and paranormal way. But our part, our still Rorschachs, as you said, our ink plots of who and what we are as souls. Yeah. You, know, you speak in your book, The Holographic Universe, of higher states of consciousness, of, you know, sort of the evolutionary force of all of this. Uh, I wonder if we can go into that uh, now. Well, I think, I, as I said, I think that we are evolving as consciousnesses, as souls. And I think that eventually we, we, we can move on to other levels of reality, non-physical levels or other channels, what I've been calling other channels on the, the cosmic TV set, the holographic TV set. And I think that to deal with those channels, that, that we, are, we are really just infants. The human race, you know, we, we, we tend to think of ourselves as very advanced, but mm -hmm. we're really like one of the... Uh, metaphors that I use is we're like babies sitting at the control panel of a jumbo jet. In our soul is, is infinite and has infinite capability, but for us to learn how to access that, those things, we, we are, at the moment, babies at the control panel just flipping switches and occasionally <coughs> causing profound things to trip into our reality, but not quite understanding them and certainly not controlling them, not seeing that the evidence, that the real evidence, for example, of a synchronicity is that our psyche does has, have reverberations in, in the world out there. And if that's the case, you know, how do we begin to really look at how to, ma to manifest things, you know, not just simple coincidences, but positive things in our life and control our thoughts enough that we don't manifest bugaboos and demons and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because we are like the sorcerer's apprentice. We have to learn to deal with this ability, and that's why it opens up slowly, because before you can deal with it, mm -hmm. you, you don't want those gateways blown open. And it would seem, I think, that many of the great mystics and, and spiritual teachers have offered uh, roadmaps or, or guidelines for entering into uh, these higher states that allow them to integrate all of these, these phenomena without getting swept away or, or getting romantic about them, but to, to see them in a, 
a kind of a larger perspective. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, and it's interesting to me that the one common thread that goes through all these roadmaps is that these other levels of reality are reached through the inner universe, through the head. You know, by going into that inner universe, that that's where this, the vastness of the true universe exists. And in our culture, we think that what's inside our head is less real than what's out there. I believe that what's inside our head is more real than the consensus reality. We just haven't accessed the level that shows us how profound and magical that, that interior reality is. Mm -hmm. Most of us. Mystics have. Yeah. And there's even a sense, if we push it, uh, that the very notion of what's inside our head, that we would even think in those terms, is, is a function of maybe that we're caught in, in what the Hindus call maya, the illusion that's created by, by the holograph. We, we see ourselves as the holographic projections rather than as the source of those projections. Right. Well, I, I, in the holographic universe, <laughs> I say that we're children that have not yet learned to color out without coloring books. Mm -hmm. We can't just freestyle draw. And that's why we're locked in this apparently solid, substantive reality. Because for most of us, our consciousness is at a point where if we were thrust into a level of reality where we could instantly manifest as real anything that we thought about, we don't control our thoughts and our emotions enough to manifest only good things. We'd start to worry about you know, something and manifest that. Mm -hmm. And so for most of us to access those levels of reality would be kind of like being on a very bad LSD trip. And that's why we're growing. And we, and, but at a certain point, we won't need the comforting borders and, and boundaries of Maya, of this physical universe. At a certain point, we'll learn how to move beyond. Well, and that sounds like something of the story that you went through in coming to terms with the poltergeist experience. Yeah, in all of my experiences. I mean, every one of them has taught me, uh, as I say, not only about the universe, but more importantly about myself and uh, what, you know, what I have to deal with. Because I think the most spiritual uh, thing a person can do is, is, you know, sometimes people say to me, gosh, I wish I had your experiences. What can I do? Can I meditate? Can I say a mantra? And sometimes the best answer is to see a therapist, deal <laughs> with your own baggage, because mm -hmm. that's, that's what, what you have to deal with first. You know, I learned this. In, I did a, on, when I was on book tour, I, I did a radio interview, a New Age radio interview in San Francisco, where uh, the man who was, was doing the interview was a substitute host. And he didn't know that we had confirmed the interview, so he was sitting as the airtime was approaching, sweating bullets, thinking I might not be there. Mm. When I arrived, he just bit my head off, really screamed at me and said, how, how dare you not confirm? And we had confirmed. He didn't know that. And he said, you know, get in here. And so I went into the control room and he sat down. The, the light went on and he, and he leaned towards the, toward the mic and he said, hello. And he started <laughs> into this new age thing. And I thought, this is just very wrong. You know, this mm -hmm. is not, you know, this, we, you cannot be a smiling spiritual person if you've got all this undealt with baggage. And that's, that is the most spiritual thing that we can do, is to learn to deal with the here and now. If you're an insecure person, you deal with your insecurity. You don't try to move objects with your head, you know, with psychokinetically. <coughs> and those are the things, because you, if you don't deal with those, you're not going to be in a very pleasant situation in that outer reality, that outer re uh, that, in that holographic reality. It's not going to be pleasant for you until you have this inner peace and, and health in your own psyche. Well, now what you're suggesting here is something uh, I think more profound than just a simple uh, platitude or a moral truth. What I think, if, if, if I can read into what you're saying, it has implications for science. It seems that for the scientific community to be able to come to terms with the many things that we've been talking about and to understand the, the full realization of, uh, uh, possible through the holographic model and other comparable models that are being developed now, it's going to require a level of personal development on the part of those scientists. Very much they so. They just won't be able to get it. We, yeah, we, I mean, I'm constantly astounded, you know, reading about some of the, the individuals, the men who worked on the atomic bomb, and they're asked, you know, well, didn't you ever think of the implications? They go, frankly, no. That's, you know, why? You know, what, what has happened to us that, that we can develop something that, that a brilliant mind can develop an atomic bomb without thinking of the implications? And that's because we don't look at the larger picture. They were just, they had their nose to the grindstone, so to speak. They were so interested in the physics of it. Mm -hmm. They didn't think of what the implications were. And clearly, our world is in desperate straits because we've done this over and over again. We've gone off in one direction or another with just one value parameter, you know, without, you know, like, well, this will help us get energy, but it might destroy the ozone layer or whatever. You know, we don't put these spiritual values or deal, you become conscious beings before we start wielding these things and 
And that's, you know, again, that's why we seem to be like infants sitting at the control panel of a jumbo jet. We've got to learn about what's inside to be able to control this control panel before mm -hmm. we start switching, and that clicking switches. And isn't just a moralism. It seems to be uh, directly implied by the notion of a seamless universe, that we can't separate our personal growth, our, our moral growth, from our understanding of the world around us. We've reached that barrier. Well, Bohm says that we have to understand that the universe is an unbroken whole, and that be, when we don't, when we fragment the universe, we are leading to our own destruction. You know, when you look at, for example, poverty without looking at education, and he applies it to sociological things like this, that you have to, and we've learned this in the ecosystem, you know, ecologically, you can't say we can do this and it won't affect that. Everything is inf infinitely interconnected on every level on every dynamical level of reality. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at the larger picture, at the, at the infinite interconnection, without focusing in on a fragment of this unbroken wholeness. Mm -hmm. Michael, I wonder, um, we've got about five minutes left, if you could kind of synthesize what we've been saying and also talk about what is the next frontier for you in well, this work? I really, well, I what I'd like to do next is I'm working on a book that is the practical application of this holographic idea. You know, in, in all of its various phases, like uh, talking about the placebo effect, and I mentioned a study where 30% of the people taking placebo of a new chemotherapy lost their hair because they were told that they might be taking a toxic drug. We've got to understand that we have this, I call it the infinite self inside us, that has enormous capability, but our conscious mind feeds it all kinds of things unwittingly and gives it all kinds of, of mistaken directions. You know, for example, I live in New York City, and a lot of people say, well, don't you think the air is killing you? Well, if I look at that placebo study, you know that these people, just that sentence, you, you know, this drug may cause you to lose your hair, caused them to lose their hair when they weren't even taking the drug. Mm -hmm. That's the power of our infinite self. We can, ca we can cause ourselves to lose our own hair. We can cause ourselves to respond in incredibly negative or incredibly positive ways just by the model of reality we hold inside our head. So one has to be very careful. Like I, when people ask me that about air pollution, I go, well, if I believed I were dying, I know that my body would respond in kind. And I want to write a book that really deals with all these things on all kinds of levels, saying, here are the practical <laughs> applications. How it weighs it, you don't have to deal with the, the very sort of heady space-time aspects of these things. Here's the way these things can impact in your everyday life, and that you've got to start looking at, you know, the, the wonder of these things, but bring them down to the, to the, the earthly level, so to speak kind of puzzled by that because you use the term the infinite self and it, and it almost seems to me there's a little catch in there like if you believe you're going to die from air pollution or now we have all these messages on cigarettes and on alcohol you know drink this and you'll get birth defects right or uh, other problems and we think we're doing a good thing and, and it suggests that we might want to re-examine some of that but if we think in terms of the infinite self maybe that's maybe it's okay to, to learn the hard way well, it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting, and I don't, uh, it's a very, very delicate issue because mm -hmm. I'm, for example, I'm not saying throw out nutritional knowledge, but I now know that, like, when I, I try to eat a healthy diet, mm -hmm. but if I eat a candy bar, I no longer tell myself, this is killing me. Mm -hmm. I bless everything that goes into my body, and I say, this will only make me better, even though I sort of, a, another part of me knows that I don't want to eat nothing but candy bars, yeah. but I tell myself that everything that happens to me is, is, is affecting me in a positive way, not a negative way, because I know of the, the value of this, of, of doing this. And the analogy that I use is that the anthropologist Gregory Bateson was in New Guinea where they have these, one of the, they use for a currency, these huge stone coins. Mm -hmm. And so whenever a major financial transaction would take place, they'd have to move one of these amazingly heavy stone coins from one community to another. During one of these events, one of these stone coins sank to the bottom of the ocean. And the fellow who was shipping it to another fellow said, well, everyone knows where it is. It's there down at the bottom of the ocean. You, it belongs to you now. No one's going to get it. The guy thought about it. He thought, okay, I'll, it's my stone coin now. And when he made a financial transaction that necessitated shipping, moving the stone coin, instead of moving it, he said, well, now it belongs to you. Everyone knows it's down there at the bottom of the ocean. And I think that's what we've got to do with belief systems. They, they continue to use the same mode of currency but without carrying the weight of the stone coins. Mm -hmm. We've got to use our nutritional knowledge without really affecting and impacting the infant itself. We've got to carry the stone coin around without the weight. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice analogy. And uh, also, by way of closing, I want to just mention what you said a moment ago, that you always bless your food because it, 
it seems that that represents an appreciation for, for the larger, one might say, holographic dimension or spiritual dimension of, of who we are and what our food is. Well, my mystics say that everything is an expression of God, and nothing that is an expression of God can hurt you. And I think that's the ultimate message, that we have to look at everything as so interconnected that we can only look at the positive aspects, even though a part of us may sort of implicitly recognize the negative aspects, but we can't put a charge on them because that activates our own belief systems, the placebo effect, a whole range of things that start to create the hologram in that way. Michael Talbot, that's a wonderful note to close on. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you.